Um, at least we have internet. I hear uh, there's, you know, even Amazon's down. So the fact that we can run a Zoom call is pretty good. So, okay, you want to bring your slides up? Yeah, do you see them? No, I don't. So good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad you can join. Um, Nico's going to do a series of two lectures. Um, and I have to admit, I remember when I first heard this lecture from Nico years ago, uh, I, do, I had to like listen to it again, uh, and then I got it. And it's a lecture that really has impacted me every day in the cath lab. It's how it's changed how I look at fluoroscopy um, because I now look at it a different way and it's all thanks to Nico. So I think for the interventional fellows, uh, for general fellows who are going into the cath lab, even for you know, experienced um, interventional cardiologists, there's a lot to gain from this series of lectures. So Nico, I'm so glad you prepared to do this and share this with everybody. Thanks, Azim, for the invitation. So, yeah, today what we're going to talk about is um, uh, the use of uh, CT uh, and trying to understand the fluoroscopic anatomy behind some of our coronary interventions. And it's almost like a back to the future, but also a glimpse to the future at the same time. Okay, so... We're gonna start by trying to understand the concepts of chamber views and how they can be used to create a common language across imaging modalities. From the chamber views, we're going to switch over to S-curves and we'll realize that there is a nice relationship that helps us better understand fluoroscopic anatomy if you combine the concepts of chamber views and S-curves. And then we'll do some little case examples um, and show you that, in fact, these chamber views and S-curves might have a, a role to play in the cath lab or at least uh, provide you uh, with some uh, knowledge to better understand what we're seeing on the fluoroscopic screen. So, you know, there, there's a few editorials out there on the emerging applications of coronary CT and geography and coronary heart disease. And people have noticed that it could be used as a diagnostic tool, a prognostic tool, monitoring patients' uh, progression, uh, CTFFR, and, and the uh, concept of hemodynamic uh, assessment. But something that is maybe forgotten or unknown uh, with coronary CT is the whole idea of procedural guidance. And so trying to understand coronary anatomy using CT, using chamber views and S-curves uh, can be very interesting. Um, I always say that this is one of my favorite slides um, and it's really the slide that got me going into this topic. Um, on the left-hand side, you see a three chamber view of the heart uh, with respect to a heart specimen. That three chamber view can be seen also on echo, on fluoro, on CT and MRI. All of these images are showing us the same structural uh, information. The relative position of structures is also the same. Um, some are more dynamic than others. Um, and of course, they all have a different shade of gray um, somewhere in between. So let's start with chamber views. And echocardiography is gonna provide us with a foundation uh, in order to better understand fluoroscopic anatomy. The one chamber view is on the top left or the short axis view. You have the two chamber view, also known as the bicommissural view. You have the three chamber view or the LVOT view, and you have the four chamber view. Now these chamber views can also be seen during fluoroscopy. You can see here, uh, we have a rotational angiogram with a pigtail sitting in the left atrium, rotating from LEO 90 to REO90 um, across the table. And if we were to pause <coughs> the rotational C-arm, we notice that we'd be coming across different chamber views. On the far, well, well in the left-sided still image, the one chamber view, you notice that the chamber, the inferior chamber is spherical. That's the short axis of the ventricle you can notice the two-chamber with the left atrial appendage 
uh, right next to the pigtail catheter. Uh, and we can also see a three chamber view. So that last slide basically tells us that chamber views do exist on fluoroscopy. We now come to CT and of course we can use a CT to translate into fluoroscopic projections. Um, and remember that the um, X-rays used on CT are the exact same ones used for fluoroscopy. Uh, the technologies are very similar, except the CT scan, of course, is rotating very quickly around the patient, whereas the C-arm, of course, is limited in terms of its positions and also uh, the fact that it's static. So there is a temporal uh, spatial resolution between CT and uh, our C arms in the cath lab. So this is a three chamber view and you can notice that there's a little, there's little numbers at the bottom telling us that we're starting in areocaudal. So three chamber view areocaudal. We move to an aleocaudal view and we end up with a short axis view aleocaudal. We move up to a four-chamber view in aleocranial. And we can finally end up in a two-chamber view, which is your everyday LV gram in the cath lab in ario 30, cranial 20, or a shallow ario cranial. And so this is the formula for chamber views on the fluoroscopic grid. One chamber, three chamber, two chamber, four chamber, going from aleocaudal to areocaudal to areocranial to aleocranial. And so if you know your anatomy on echocardiography, you can apply that anatomy directly to the fluoroscopic screen. So let's talk a, a moment about S-curves. So an S-curve provides you with different projections whereby you can see a structure and plane. And so for every LAO and ARIO, there's a corresponding cranial and caudal projection where your structure of interest is in plane. There's a few interesting concepts about S-curves. Uh, we're not going to review all of them. But one of the more important ones is the fact that an S-curve transects three quadrants only. And so on the case on the left side of your screen, the S-curve intersects in aleocranial, areocranial, and areocaudal. In those three quadrants, that structure will be in plane. The quadrant in which the S-curve does not intersect is the quadrant where that structure is seen on fast or in short axis. So this is an example, in fact, of a mitral valve or tricuspid valve S-curve, meaning that we can get the mitral valve in plane in aleocranial, areocranial, and areocaudal. If we would like to see the mitral valve on FAS, we would move to a aleocaudal view. And so you can get S-curves of basically any structure in the heart. Superior vena cava, IVC, coronary sinus, tricuspid valve, pulmonary valve, pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, mitral valve, um, aortic valve, coronary arteries. Whatever you can draw a plane to, you can get an S-curve. And so the thing that is very, very important in performing fluoroscopic procedures is that we're dealing usually with a device and the anatomy on fluoroscopy. In order for you to best understand measurements, the positioning, the angle differences between two structures, and therefore the trajectory you need to take, you need to have the two structures of interest or the beginning and end of your trajectory, both in plane. 
or one has to be in plane and the other one needs to be en face. That way you're going to minimize parallax or foreshortening with respect to your anatomy or your device. And so everything that I tried to do in the cath lab, whether it's with coronaries, whether it's aortic or mitral valves or tricuspid valves, is always to minimize parallax and foreshortening. And the only way to do that is to work in projections where you're on the S-curve or on the en face view of your structure of interest. So let's continue on with S-curves. And this is the S-curve of the aortic valve. You can see we start with a in the areocaudal projection. We then move to an AP projection, followed by an aleocranial projection, an extreme aleocranial. And you can see that as we drove along the aortic valve S-curve, we always see the valve in plane. Notice that in this case, the, the S-curve intersects the areocaudal, aleocaudal, and aleocranial. And so the aortic valve is typically seen on fast in areocranial. Now, remember this grid and the fluoroscopic chamber formula. We can apply an S-curve to this. And so as you are riding along an S-curve, any S-curve, you are in fact transecting chamber views. And so now it becomes even more interesting because you can get your structure of interest in plane in a particular chamber view. For instance, when I do transeptal mitral valve replacements, I always deploy the valve in aleocranial, no matter what the therapy is. Why? Because in aleocranial, I have the mitral valve in plane. I have the atrial septum in plane. I understand the relationship between the atrial septum and mitral valve. And so I understand the trajectory. I understand the push and pull along the mitral valve. And it just so happens that most of the time, the four chamber view gives you the major axis of your mitral valve almost. So remember that we got chamber views from our echo. They could be seen on fluoro. We got S curves and with our S curves, we can uh, drive through chamber views. And so Tabby really set the stage for the use of CT and understanding fluoroscopic projections for the procedure. We never performed structural heart disease interventions at a rate that we're doing today. And we never developed that pattern recognition that we have for coronary interventions. Coronary interventions started back in 77. And if you go back to papers to the late 70s and early 80s, you'll notice that people were reporting case reports, case cohorts of five to 10 patients on how to image the proximal LAD. And they would just say, you know, the areocranial or the aleocranial is a great view for the proximal to mid LAD. And then that became pattern recognition. Throughout all these years, we never thought of obtaining specific fluoroscopic viewing angles for coronary intervention. I guess we think we're good enough, but the question is, can we enhance our procedures? So in the structural field, we're moving towards pattern recognition. When we're doing left atrial appendage occlusions, we sort of have a gist of now where to go if we're gonna go into areocranial to implant our device or some other view. You see here at the bottom of the screen, you have the mitral annulus in turquoise, you have the aortic valve in yellow, you have the atrial septum in green. And in each of these chamber views, the relative position of these structures, as you would expect them on echo, are always the same. So for instance, 
in the three chamber view, your atrial septum is on FAS. In your three chamber view, you can separate nicely your aortic valve from your atrial septum. If you go into a steep areocaudal view to get your three chamber view during a transeptal puncture, you can make sure that your needle is pointing into the screen and hanging away from the aortic valve. Again, you see the four chamber view, the atrial septum in green, the mitral valve in turquoise, both structures are in plane. You get the major axis of the mitral valve, the major axis of the aortic valve all the time in the two chamber view. You get the minor axis of the aortic valve, the minor axis of the mitral valve in the three chamber view. That might be interesting when you're deploying an aortic valve, for instance, and you want to implant in the minor axis in the three chamber view. The three chamber view, uh, as a glimpse to our next session, is the cusp overlap view. So we'll be seeing that chamber views can be used to develop this pattern recognition in structural heart disease and also in coronary interventions. Now, having said that, I believe that in the future, we'll be moving away from pattern recognition for coronary interventions and becoming more patient specific. Here you have a three chamber view, a four chamber view and a one chamber view of the, co of the uh, coronary arteries. The purple plane is the mitral valve and you can see the red circumflex artery wrapping around the mitral valve in the three chamber view. You have the yellow LAD and you can start to see that, hey, these views or these shots of the coronaries look very familiar. Well, all this time when you're injecting a coronary in iliocranial, you were injecting in a four chamber view. And we'll see how the coronaries come to play with the chamber views. So let's talk about some basic coronary anatomy because you're going to see that talking about the basics is going to allow us to understand the complex on the fluoroscopic screens. The first thing to, to understand is that the right coronary artery and the circumflex wrap around the tricuspid and mitral valve annulus. Simple concept, but yet it's going to be very, very important. Why? Because if you know your chamber views, if you know where your mitral and tricuspid valves are, you can understand whether your tricuspid annulus is on fast. So you're, you're going to get a C of the RCA. You can understand if these valves are in plane. And so you'll be able to understand the takeoffs and the course of the main RCA and circumflex arteries if you understand where the mitral and tricuspid valves are on the chamber views. Now, as the right coronary drops, uh, wraps around the tricuspid valve, it's going to give a PDA and the PL. We're going to talk about that very shortly. And we're going to talk about coronary dominance as well. Okay. The next thing is to talk about the left anterior descending or what uh, is also known as the in anterior interventricular artery. It's called anterior interventricular because it splits the two ventricles. It runs along the septum. The LAD runs along the septum. And so if you know where the septum is on your chamber views, you will know where the body of the LAD needs to be. We now move to the PDA or the posterior descending artery. It's also known as the posterior interventricular artery. And so it runs along the posterior half of the septum. Now notice, let's see if this works here. Notice that as the circumflex, sorry, as the uh, PDA wraps around the mitral uh, tricuspid annulus, it gives off a PDA along the septum 
right? Because this is the left ventricle and that is the right ventricle. And then the RCA continues its course on the posterior mitral annulus. And as it continues its course, it drops a PL1, a PL2, and a PL3, depending on the patient's anatomy. Now, this may seem like uh, perhaps uh, semantics, but if you think about it, I would say that all of this blue is the body of the RCA. And the RCA, as it runs around the base of the heart, it drapes the heart with vessels to supply the vessels, uh, the, uh, the myocardium. And so you might have even a dual PDA system. And then you might have a PL1, a PL2, a PL3, and a PL4. Okay. We'll also look at the heart orientation and how this is important to understand chamber anatomies. Now, the other thing we want to understand is that you have a heart orientation. On the left-hand side, you have um, what we call a three-chamber view, or um, you can see that the heart looks uh, pretty elliptical. On the right-hand side, the heart looks more spherical, okay? And so a little quick trick for those just starting interventional cardiology is that in the vast majority of patients, when you have a vertical ellipse, you're in a four-chamber view. If you have an oblique ellipse, you're an areocranial. If you have a horizontal ellipse, you're an areocaudal. And if you have a spherical uh, shaped heart, you're probably an aleocaudal. Okay. Sometimes this allows you to quickly understand what you're looking at on the screen in terms of chamber views. And so you can try to understand what does the heart silhouette uh, look like maybe based on the pericardium or based on the course of the arteries. And sometimes you can uh, take that information and translate that into a uh, four chamber, two chamber or three chamber view of the heart. Now notice, notice that um, this is an ARIO 30. So it's the classic LV-gram we perform every day. In yellow, we have what we typically call the anteroseptal or the anterior wall. In blue, what we have the inferior or the posterior wall. But notice what happens when we go from a two-chamber view to a four-chamber view. We can now see the septal, anteroseptal wall clearly in green and the lateral wall in orange. And so we can do this again. Now, why is this interesting? Is because if you understand the regional walls, if you understand your chamber views, if you understand that you need to maximally separate arteries, in order to visualize perhaps the LAD and the circumflex nicely, you can then play around with all these fluoroscopic viewing angles in order to nicely separate the arteries. And so you can see here in the four chamber view that you separate nicely your anteroseptal from your lateral wall. And so you'll separate the LAD and then you'll have a bunch of vessels, the diags and the OMs that go laterally, whether they're anterior or posterior. And so we know our walls on echocardiography. Whenever you have an anterior wall, the corresponding wall is posterior. Whenever you have a septal wall, the corresponding wall is lateral. And that holds true for any imaging modality, as we'll see. 
Even when we do MIBIs, we have chamber views. Okay, you have the rest, the stress and rest images of the one chamber view from base to apex. You have the two chamber views and then finally the four chamber views. And again, you have the short axis view, anterior, posterior, septal, lateral. You have the two chamber view, anterior, posterior, and the four chamber view, septal, lateral. And so now you can start to imagine that you can really start to integrate all of these imaging modalities because the heart can only be cut in so many ways because of its shape. And the fact that all of our imaging modalities are sending x-rays or beams that are perpendicular to the heart. And so those similar um, uh, regional walls can be appreciated on fluoroscopy. Now look here, this is what people call the spider view. Uh, this is really the short axis view. You have the circumflex that is wrapping around, uh, let me, you have the circumflex that is wrapping around the mitral valve. Here's a circumflex going like this. Okay. Notice that you have OMs coming this way. Now, you can start to realize all of a sudden that the OMs are supplying the postural lateral wall. Okay. Now, you also have the LAD that's doing this, okay? And remember that the, sorry, I'm just changing pen colors here, that we don't see it, but you have the tricuspid valve or the RV that is also a double barrel, okay? And so the LAD is splitting the RV from the LV. And look what we have on top. We have the LAD, the LAD giving diagonal, and that is the anterolateral wall. Here we have the four chamber view of the heart. We know that we would have here the mitral valve, the left atrium, the LV, and we have the RV and, L and RA. Now, a few things to note is that the LAD is running along the anterior interventricular septum. Okay, so it's running along the anterior ventricular septum, and here it is running along the septum. It provides septals to, pro to supply the, the septum, which is right there, and then it provides diags that are running towards the lateral wall. Notice that on this side here, you have the OMs that are also found against the lateral wall. Of course, what you don't appreciate in the four chamber view is what is anterior or what is posterior. But now you're starting to realize that in fact, what you see on the fluoroscopic screen actually makes sense. I use the four chamber view to quickly give me an idea of whether or not I'm dealing with a left or right coronary dominant system and whether or not that left coronary dominant system has PLs or a PDA. Remember that we have our septum here and we have the LAD running along the septum in the four chamber view. Remember that the PDA 
is a posterior interventricular artery. So if you have the anterior and the posterior interventricular septum overlapped in the four chamber view, that means that if you have a PDA that's coming from the left and is going in the posterior interventricular septum, it should come and overlap or at least interfere with your visualization of the LAD. On the left-hand side, there is no other vessel other than the LAD across the septum. On the right-hand side, notice that we have something that appears to be wrapping around something, which is in fact wrapping around the mitral annulus and then gives PLs and finally fans out to a PDA. And you can see now that it's overlapping the LAD. Okay, and so uh, with the circumflex, you first have the circumflex running around the mitral annulus, giving off OMs, giving off PLs, and then finally giving off the PDA. On the other hand, the RCA does the opposite. It first gives the PDA and then continues along the posterior mitral annulus to drop PLs. So let me just give you a, a few cases to, uh, to highlight the, this whole concept of chamber views. What you'll see is not very traditional in some, in some ways, but I, I did this during the procedures in order to confirm the understandings that we're trying to show you today. And so that way uh, you could uh, maybe appreciate that in fact, all of this is true. Now, this is an LV-gram, a right coronary shot and a left coronary shot, all performed in LEO 20 cranial 35. Think about that, that's very important. Because now if you can fuse those images in your mind, you might understand maybe where a CTO needs to go based on the collaterals. You might understand even the relationship of saphenous vein grafts coming from different places and going to different regions of the wall. In fact, one of the um, you know, best applications of these chamber views is sometimes to understand complicated saphenous vein graft anatomy. Because if you understand your chamber views, you understand the walls, then you understand where the target bypass is going towards. Going back to this case, we can somehow overlap all of these and better understand what we're doing. Remember, this is a four chamber view of the heart. And so when you overlap all of this, this is what you get. Notice that the PDA is overlapping the left anterior descending. Notice that the PLs, oh, sorry about that. Notice that the PLs are going towards the lateral wall, right? The corresponding lateral is septal wall. Okay, then you have a branch here that is probably a ramus going to the anterolateral wall. You have diags and you got the OMs running along the lateral wall. Remember, we cannot tell what is lateral and what is, what is anterior and posterior on aleocranial. Aleocranial is also a great view to understand ventricular septal defects, not aleocaudal, not aleo 30 you should go in aleocranial. Why? You elongate the ventricle and you can identify at which level the VSD is found at. The classic teachings we see in Grossman and other textbooks is LEO 30. Uh, in fact, that gives you a, a one chamber view. You severely foreshorten the ventricle. You have no idea 
of wear along the long axis of the septum, uh, you have your defect. It's also the view that we use to close VSDs. So let me give you an example here of uh, a patient that came in with an MI. And so, you know, someone reading the classic LV gram on the left hand side, two chamber view, would say, you know, look, there's uh, something going on in the distal. Uh, anterior wall definitely the apex looks dyskinetic and it's involving also the uh, maybe uh, distal inferior wall as well that's the two chamber view now look at the four chamber view next door you can clearly see what the problem is the problem is that this patient has dyskinesis of the mid to distal anteral septal wall. Look at this area here, how it's bulging. Okay, so it becomes more specific in understanding what the pathology is and perhaps what the culprit is. Of course, when you do your coronary angiogram, you'll get to know that. But in this way, you can also understand ejection fractions much better. Why don't we do what the echocardiographers do? They look at, a, at the ejection fractions and measure it in a two chamber, four chamber and three chamber, where we can do the same thing on fluoroscopy. Of course, uh, when you look at the anatomy of this patient, there was an LAD that was occluded, okay? And so, yeah, hold on, let me go back to my arrow. Yeah, and so if we see here, if we let this play, this was the area where we had the defect. Notice that the defect was at around the same level as where we had the septal bulge or the dyskinesis. So let's try to better understand fluoroscopic viewing angles for coronary interventions. This is the short axis view of the aortic valve. You have the non-coronary cusp in yellow, you have the right coronary cusp in red, and you have the left coronary cusp in green. Now you can wrap around the aortic annulus and you'll get its S-curve, what you see on the right-hand side. Now, if you look at the annulus in plane from this point of view, number one, what you'll notice is that you have in, in this projection, you have the left and right cusps overlapped and you will isolate the non-coronary cusp. Okay, so you have left and right overlapped and isolation of the non. That's in areocaudal. Areocaudal, remember, for the TAVR implanters out there is the right-left cusp overlap view or the non-coronary cusp isolation view. If we look at this from the viewpoint of number two, in this projection, we'll have the right isolated, we have the non-isolated, and we have the left isolated. So there is no cusp overlap here. We have the three cusp coplanar view, which is typically found in AP. If we look from the third point of view, we'll notice that in this case, we will overlap the right and the non, and we will isolate the left. So number three is left cusp isolation in aleocranial. You'll see that as you isolate your left cusp, you will get the best view for the left osteal coronary artery. We'll do the same thing for the right cusp which is found in an extreme aleocranial. 
But just to give you an idea that you can wrap around the annulus and get different cusp overlaps and perhaps isolate the ostiums of the coronaries as you isolate the cusps. And so you can create a summary table where in the three chamber view, you have the non cusp, non coronary cusp isolated. In the four chamber, you have the left cusp isolated. And if you go to an extreme LAO, meaning LAO greater than 70 and some cranial, you'll get the right cusp isolated. And so this is the summary of cusp isolation along the aortic annulus S-curve. Why are we using the aortic annulus S-curve is because as you get the annulus in plane, you stretch open the aortic root. As you stretch open the aortic root, you are not creating parallax within the aortic root, and therefore you can nicely isolate your uh, coronary cusps. So the big dots have the non-left and right cusp isolated, and the green and uh, purple dots have the three cusp coplanar view, albeit with different orders of the right, non, and left cusp. Just to, to give an idea of, of why understanding cusps anatomy might be important, um, and how we may be going from, you know, TAVR related challenges to you know, everyday challenges of stenting the left main. You see that as this video is, is moving, that we've hi highlighted the ostium of the left main in yellow. And there is a point where the orange aortic annulus becomes in plane with the yellow left main. And that's going to be important because we're going to be talking about S-curves of the aortic annulus and left main to get that best view. But think about it. When you're in the cath lab and you have to intubate this left main, the question is which strut will you be going across to intubate the left main? And can you become coaxial so that you can have uh, a, a more efficient intub intubation, evaluation, and potentially intervention. And so comes the concept of double S-curves. You may have heard me talk of double S-curves for TAVR, but the concept of double S-curves, again, comes into play with the idea of getting two structures in plane in order to understand the anatomy better. And so here we have the aortic annulus S-curve in yellow. You have the left main S-curve in blue. Where, the, where they both intersect is where they're both in plane. Notice that the intersection point is an iliocranial. It's in a four-chamber view. If you recall, and we'll see this a little bit better later on, the double S of the aortic annulus and left main always intersect with the left cusp isolation view. And so there's actually two ways to get the best view of the left main, ostium that is. Do a double S of the aortic annulus or left main or isolate the left coronary cusp. And so this now becomes almost familiar and, you know, we say in French, l'histoire se répète, history repeats itself, at least for me, where I developed a double S-curve for TAVR, but then we use the non-coronary cusp isolation or cusp, the right-left cusp overlap for TAVR, which is always in the areocaudal three-chamber. Now, the sort of concept of double s curves for coronary comes in, finding the best view for the left main, using double S, but in fact, you can isolate the left cusp to get that best view as well, and it's always an iliocranial, and they both give you the same answer. So let's see how it looks. So if you would have to do or investigate a patient with a TAVR, 
And you need to evaluate the coronaries, whether it's intra-procedural during the index procedure or after, you might want to find the best view for that left main. And so this is the best view for that left main. Notice how clearly we can understand the anatomy. And that fluoroscopic image on the left-hand side is the exact same one you see on your right there on CT and on uh, the uh, simulated fluoro. It looks identical. And if you were to intubate this, if you were to stent the ostium left main, you can see that you would have no issues in placing your stent nicely across the superior or inferior border, depending on what you'd like to do. And so we actually published on this, looking at the best optimal views for coronaries using CT. This was a study of 100 patients those 100 red dots, and the optimal fluoroscopic viewing angle for the osteo left main, not the left main bifurcation, the osteo left main, was nearly unanimously in the LAO, uh, LAO uh, cranial quadrant for chamber view, which in fact is isolation of the left coronary cusp. And so never, ever, 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 ever stent the osteum of the left main in areocranial. It doesn't work. Don't do it in aleocaudal. Don't do it in areocaudal. Go in aleocranial. If I don't have a CT scan, what I'll do is I'll work in the four quad, I'll, I'll develop maybe five mini quadrants in the aleocranial quadrant, meaning that I'll go very shallow aleocranial, very lateral. LAO, but shallow cranial. I'll move extreme LAO cranial. I'll go shallow LAO, but extreme cranial and something maybe in between. And I'll give little puffs across the LAO quadrant in order to come across the best viewing angle of the osteo left main. And I promise you, you will find it with about two or three puffs. We can do the same thing for the right coronary get the double S of the right coronary ostium of the auric annulus. You see on the right-hand side, you get a perfect visualization. Again, this view of the double S is like isolating the right coronary cusp. And so isolation of the right coronary cusp is an extreme LAO. It's almost, it's a lateral shock, basically, an LAO 80, LAO 90. And you can see that it goes very high. Notice that all those green dots are outside the gray field. The gray field is where our sea arms can reach. This means that in the vast, vast majority of patients, you cannot obtain an optimal viewing angle of the osteo right coronary. In fact, if you look at studies looking at geographic stent miss of the osteal RCA using CT scans after the fact, the geographic stent miss of the osteal RCA is somewhere between 50 and 75%. Sometimes it's way too deep. Sometimes it's way too out into the aorta. And then we wonder why the osteal rights have problems with restenosis. And so although we cannot achieve the perfect view, at least you should try to tell yourself, how can we optimize things? And so I never stent an osteal RCA in areocaudal. The areocaudal view is for the proximal segment, not the osteal RCA, it's for the proximal RCA. Why is it for the proximal RCA? Because in aleocaudal, you start to get the short axis view of the tricuspid valve. And so you open up the curvature, okay? And you get the body of the RCA in aleocaudal. It's horrible for the ostium of the right. And so what I do when I stent the rights, it might be a little bit inconvenient for a few seconds, but I go LAO 70, cranial 20, sometimes LAO 80, LAO 90, cranial 5, cranial 10, whatever I can get. And I position and I inject on that view. Once I got it, I, deflate, I inflate my stent, deploy my stent, 
and then I move back to something a little bit more comfortable. And so this is how the right coronary might look when you get the perfect view. This is LEO 85, cranial 37. Okay, ask yourself, when was the last time you evaluated an osteorite in LEO 85, cranial 37? Now, the other interesting thing with all of this is that you may want to develop a record book in your cath labs for patients who have transcatheter aortic valves and maybe just record what is the optimal view for the left and right coronary artery just in case if someone's on call uh, and has difficulty understanding the coronary anatomy, you have a pre-procedural CT whereby you can collect all of this information and make it available for future interventions. Now, if you don't have double S-curve capabilities, if you want to do this quick and dirty, get your aortic annulus plane, as you see here in orange, draw the plane of the left main uh, ostium, and then rotate along the aortic annulus until you get your plane of the left main. Okay, and you can see here in this case, it's LEO 23, cranial 30. Let me show you a, a quick uh, case example. Okay, um, this was someone uh, who uh, came in and had to have their left main investigated. And you can see that uh, the double S curve of the uh, left main ostium and aortic annulus was LEO 22, cranial 3. Okay, so in this case, that was the best view for the left main. So notice that we have an optimal view and we have a non-selective injection. You can think about this in many ways. You can have non-optimal view, non-selective. You can have optimal view and be non-selective. You can be non-optimal and selective. You can be optimal and selective. Okay, and so on the right-hand side, we are optimal and we are selective. Okay, the interesting thing about getting the proper view and opening up that left main is that you are not fighting whether or not your artery is relatively anterior or posterior relative to your non-optimal view. Once you get the left main looking out very nicely, you can take your JL, and remember, your JL catheters, your JR catheters are usually 0.5 size smaller because the evolute shrinks your aortic root. But once your left main and right coronary artery are opened up, what you do is you take your delivery catheters and you line them up maximally spread open. Take your JL. Don't make your JL look like this, like this. Make your JL look like this so that you can snap open the mouth of the um, guide catheter, and it will be pointing into the left main. And you can see here, you can nicely uh, advance a guide liner. Once you're just into the strut, you can consider advancing a guide liner so that you have nice access to the coronaries. This is an example of being non-optimal and non-selective. Okay. Let's talk quickly about bifurcations in, in two, three minutes, and then we'll stop. So we have optimal views for, for coronary ostia, but we can also talk about optimal views for bifurcations. And I think this is very important and something that has been misregarded uh, in the past 40 years of PCI, especially studies that have looked at bifurcation techniques, bifurcation lesions and outcomes. Because as we'll see that two geographical, two different geographical bifurcations, example, LEDD1 versus RCA PD, uh, PDA PLA, they're completely different beasts in terms of obtaining optimal views 
And then if you cannot get an optimal view, you have to question yourself, what technique am I going to use in order to protect myself? It's hard to treat something you can't see. If you do not have an optimal view or if your uh, viewing angle is providing you something that you just can't understand with respect to a bifurcation, especially the ostium of the side branch, think about it. How will you do a mini tap? How are you going to position two or three millimeters of strut protruding out into the LAD if you can't even see the ostium properly? This is why perhaps there are some studies using DK crush or culotte whereby you have a sort of factor of safety whereby you deploy the stent a few millimeters into the main branch and you protect yourself from the non-optimal views. But we, that, that's a discussion for another time. But here you can get an optimal view of the bifurcations by putting a point in the prox in the proximal main branch, distal main branch, and side branch, and then putting that all in plane. Let's quickly look at optimal fluoroscopic viewing angles for the left main bifurcation. Again, 100 patients. Notice that it's spread across the LEO, REO caudal quadrants. And so the average is AP caudal here, AP caudal 40. The take home message from this scatter plot is that they're not concentrated in one quadrant. And so if you don't have a CT to get the best fluoroscopic viewing angle for your left main bifurcation, you're going to have to test it somewhere LAO caudal. You can see that many of them are, are even more caudal than 40. So what I tend to do is I go as caudal as I can, and then I go REO 20, caudal 40, AP, caudal 40, LAO 20, caudal 40, and I do a little test injection of the left main to see where in that patient I get the best view. This is the LED diag. It is the most horrendous bifurcation to image. In our study, only two or three percent of patients are in the optimal, are in the accessible gray zone. All the others are in extreme cranial or extreme caudal. Right? And you can see that the best view again spans across the RAO LAO platform. And so what I do for LED D1 bifurcations is that I start extremely cranial and I'll test it in LEO 30, AP and REO 30, always keeping cranial 30 to 40. For the left circumflex OM bifurcation, again, you can see that you're spread across the LEO, REO caudal quadrants. And so again, you have to test a little puff in, 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 in the different views. Uh, in order to best appreciate the bifurcation angle. Um, and again, uh, for the PDA PL, you can see that the vast majority are in aleocranial. Not only aleocranial, they're extreme cranial. Okay. And so whenever you, you, you treat a PDA PL bifurcation, try to get yourself as cranial as possible and test yourself in LEO 10, LEO 30, LEO 40, LEO 50, LEO 60. Have an idea. If you memorize these scatter plots, you can tell yourself where you may need to test in order to optimize your views. In the future, we're going to have some fluoroscopic grid, I believe, something like this, where you have all the best views for all the different things for that particular patient whether it's the chamber views, whether it's the view for the bifurcation, uh, whether it's the uh, D1, D2 bifurcation. Um, and so, you know, you'll be set up to go uh, in the cath lab. We're also hearing about, you know, using CT for hemodynamic assessment. 
And who knows that in the future, um, we're going to be using coronary CT like we use for TAVR. We'll understand vascular access. Maybe we'll know that the brachiocephalic is extremely tortuous. Uh, we'll be able to select our equipment, uh, whether we need a, a long sheath, a short sheath, uh, whether we need uh, a JL45, depending on the um, ascending aorta characteristics. Uh, we'll have the optimal fluoroscopic viewing angles. Uh, we'll know our PCI strategy uh, by understanding whether or not there is circumferential calcium on the artery, whether we need rotablator. Right now we're using fluoroscopy uh, to tell us whether or not we need uh, uh, rotablation based on whether or not we see calcium. Uh, think about how archaic is that uh, after 40 years of PCI. Um, and, you know, we've shown in the in previous studies that using coronary CT analyses reduces contrast volume, reduces radiation, reduces uh, procedural times, um, and it's more cost effectiveness, at least for investigating coronary disease. So, um, Azim, sorry for, uh, I think we're exactly at an hour's time. Um, and, uh, yeah, maybe we can take a few questions if there are out there. Yeah. Um, I think most people are kind of speechless absorbing it. I, I love this talk. Um, you know, I've heard all your talks. I think this is only the second time I hear your coronary talk. And we, I mean, me and Juan were just talking about how much we've learned listening to you. Juan, did you have any specific questions? No, no, as, you, as you said, it's, uh, it's really, really amazing. Uh, uh, I mean, this is actually a talk that every single fellow and junior faculty actually should really listen to. Um, it's, it's really amazing how much guessing, you know, um, it is involved in, in the things that we do and, and what you just said is really right on and can really impact a patient's outcomes. Well, I'm really glad Leandro is on. Leandro is, you know, uh, very involved in our CT program. So now he kind of knows what we can expect from him in the future. <laughs> 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 not just you know telling us that there's a lesion you know which he does very he's very good at telling us but also telling us exactly what projection we need and maybe whether we need um more specific uh um lesion preparation um there was one question from aisha carter who's a good friend hey aisha good to see you um she says really fascinating talk and she asks and this is something we often struggle with um, can you leverage these techniques when looking for graphs, especially in the absence of previous records or markers or rings on the aorta? Say that again, uh, Azim. Can, can we leverage these techniques of fluoroscopic projections when looking for bypass graphs? You know, because that's often happens. Patient comes in, you know, they had, they've got a couple of bypass graphs, but there's no information about where they are. Sure. Yeah. So what I like to do, uh, so a few things about bypass grafts, and I've uh, I've analyzed anecdotally uh, probably about, uh, I would say, 40 to 50 CT scans with bypasses. And uh, the anecdotal findings are the following. First, if you want to intubate the Lima, okay, mm -hmm. um, always do it in areocranial. Uh, you go to areocranial and it's amazing. I don't know if you, let me, I can't see myself anymore. Um, do you see me, uh, Azim? Yeah, we can see you. Yeah. Uh, you know, what you're basically doing is elongating the subclavian and getting your left main to hang down. The le uh, the Sorry, the lima to hang down. The lima is not looking on fast at you like an AP projection. You take the lima ostium and you bring it looking down and so what you need to do is just put your catheter pointing down and pull. Okay, so if you're going to intubate the lima, always do it in an extreme areocranial, areo 30, cranial 30. The other thing that I've sort of come to uh, appreciate sometimes is that we neglect the LEO 90 view, the lateral view. Most grafts, all grafts, come off the anterior aspect of the aorta. And of course, surgeons sometimes put them slightly to the left and so slightly to the right. That's why we, we look at REO30 and LEO30. But 
I, I like to do I like to search for my graphs in LEO90 because I know where the anterior and posterior aorta is. And I also have a visual understanding of the height. And so once I have one artery in LEO90, I can go up or down and I just, you know, counterclock or clock my catheter a little bit as I'm coming up or down the ascending aorta. So I like LEO90. Um, and I, you know, again, I, I've looked at um, um, CT scans for this and it seems that you know, if you get the plane of the ascending aorta and the plane of the ostium, their double S curves intersect in an extreme LEO90 most of the time. Okay. Um, also, when you're doing, uh, when you're stenting osteal stent gra uh, osteal grafts, uh, again, look for that optimal view because there is an optimal view um, and you just have to look for it. Um, if you have a CT scan, uh, or you're analyzing a CT scan of a patient with a tavern in the future and they have bypass graphs, just try looking at where you can see the graphs the best. Absolutely. I like the REO2 for the Lima, but I'm, I didn't do enough cranials. I'm going to try doing that from now on. And for uh, the Rima and for the Lima, it's LEO cranial. LEO cranial. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, and yes, yeah, so yes, there, there's a question. Um, what's the best view to assess aortic regurgitation post tava Is it the REO caudal view? Okay, because it gives you a three-chamber view and elongates the LVOT. Yes, yes. So that, yeah, I, yes. It, the, the best view to appreciate uh, aortic regurg is a view where you elongate the ventricle, you elongate the LVOT, and you elongate the aorta, which is an REO caudal three-chamber view. Never assess aortic regurge in LEO30 like is taught in the textbooks. Because what you're doing is you're getting a, a short axis of the ventricle and mm -hmm. then you're overestimating uh, the amount of regurge because you're foreshortening the ventricle and you're stacking up all of the base to apex of the heart. And so right. you want to open up that ventricle. If you want to assess the ascending aorta for your ortogram, you do that in LEO30 because there you open up the ascending arch. In REO caudal three chamber view, you're overlapping the ascending and descending. It's a horrible view to understand the ascending aortic dilatation or even dissections. So when someone comes in for aortic regurge, I always do the two views. I go REO caudal to assess the regurge. I go LEO 30 to assess the ascending aorta in order to open it up. Right, absolutely. Uh, couldn't agree more. I think also the REO, as you know, Antonio and the older guys teach, also separates the descending aorta so you don't get confused with contrast in Correct. the descending aorta that's behind the ventricle, which Correct. is also very useful. Um, Nico, I mean, that was phenomenal. I'm going to suggest to everybody to re-watch this again uh, because it really, every time I, yeah. I listen to this and I listen to your talk, I learn something new. Um, I can't wait for next week. Uh, thank you so much, my friend. Okay, Thanks got it. Hi, Nico. Ciao, nice to Nico. see you on. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> we miss you, man. See you soon. Hey, right. see you soon. Okay. Ciao, guys. Ciao, ciao. ciao. ciao, ciao.